Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where today John Coleman and I get to speak with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. John, good to see you again. Good to be back. Um, of course, people know that you are a food and travel writer of great repute and that the virtual gourmet is a weekly newsletter, free by the way. Art, tell them where to get it. JohnMariani.com. And by the way, before we go into today's topic, whatever it happens to be, uh, going after Harry Lyme, uh, we're up to like chapter 20, it's an amazing uh, yes. uh, uh, a journey through getting your serialized novel, your latest, because you have many uh, uh, books and uh, both uh, on uh, uh, food and uh, your creative, your purely creative side, which is uh, your novels, which are really fun. But this is a terrific, I can't wait for the next chapter. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. just heating up, Bart. It's just heating up. The twists and turns you won't believe. It, it, um, it is. And they're, they're, at a, they're at a really critical part now. So it, I would suggest anybody get there, going after Harry Lyme, and in the archives, you can start reading it from chapter one. But I think we're up to like, we're in the 20s now, like 27 or something. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, all have to be, they all have to be approximately 1,200 to 1,500 words. Um, to fit the format, but uh, unlike the James, you know, James Patterson's novels, which he doesn't write anymore, James Patterson novels are all three pages long each chapter. Yes. Mm. But they're yeah. what I call delayed airport books, delayed airline flight books. <laughs> oh, God, four hours. Well, you could read six of his novels in four hours. Well, there's no doubt that the Virtual Gourmet newsletter is a chock full of great stuff. But mm. where I was going to take this was to Italian restaurants. Mm. You being a, a paisan, a, a gentleman of Italian extraction. Um, but you obviously review some of the finest Italian restaurants in the world. But where I was going to take this was the fact that in, here in the United States, Every corner has an Italian restaurant, a, a quote Italian restaurant. I think of, <laughs> you know, all the pizza places that are quote Italian restaurants. And then there's, there's chain restaurants that are quote Italian themed maybe, or they're, and they serve decent Italian food, but it's not, it's not the real Italian food, is it? No, it's uh, not Italian, <clears throat> not because they're not, as, as I, but... Mention that if you go to Olive Garden or Macaroni Grill right. or, uh, well, Pizza Hut, I guess they serve food as I pizza. I don't even know. But if you go there, you will get something called lasagna, but it will be made from a corporate recipe uh, from ingredients that are shipped in, not straight from Italy uh, every morning. Um, and, and it's just it, it's the difference, as you said, between quality and quantity. They're making massive, massive amounts of food that should be made to order as, a, as they are in real Italian restaurants. I mean, there's no place in Italy itself I know of unless I don't even know they have a pizza. They'd probably be driven out of out of uh, and lynched. But um, <clears throat> in, in Italy, you're never going to go to a restaurant with 350 seats and uh, tossing out pizza after pizza after pizza. And, and what do you want? You want lasagna? We're going to give you garlic bread with that. I and mean, it just doesn't happen because and that, but that's true of all good restaurants. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, now if that's the experience that you like family restaurant, you're going to hire kids birthday party but no it's not it's just the same as pf chang's and versus chinese food and and so forth so what's happened though was very interesting uh those chains are what most americans think of as italian food just as they think of mexican food as taco bell and uh pf chang's is chinese food um sure. so unfortunately that's most what americans but as you say uh, there are now smaller, good, very good Italian restaurants on every corner, which are individually owned or small chains, three or four mom and pop things. And what happened was because of the prevalence of the um, uh, the, the bad the bad chains, that Italian food as of the 70s and 80s in the cities got much better ingredients, real Italian ingredients, olive oil, parmigiano, mozzarella, white truffles, and created this so-called northern Italian cuisine, which is just a misnomer because they, they could also be serving lasagna. But this was much, much better. And they were setting the example in cities like 
like specifically uh, uh, um, Los Angeles, uh, some great, great upscale Italian restaurants like Valentino, and in New York, a place like San Domenico, which was the real McCoy. The trouble with those was that they, those restaurateurs themselves would diss Italian American food, the spaghetti and meatballs, which you can get in Italy. You can get spaghetti with meatballs. Sometimes they're called polpette. Sometimes they're on the side in a tomato sauce, not with, with the pasta, but it doesn't matter. It's, they do have meatballs in Italy. Um, all of these dishes that were beloved dishes until the chains got hold of them um, were really, really dismissed as being not worth your time and uh, greasy and garlicky and oily and so forth. There has been a renaissance, a really big renaissance of that kind of cooking, not the greasy, garlicky kind, but of <laughs> Italian, basic Italian food, regional Italian food, Italian-American food. Um, one of the biggest hits, unjustifiably, because they charge $65 for veal parm, you know, maybe $70 at this point, is a place um, uh, in, the, in, in Greenwich Village that's called Carmine's. And Carmine's is jammed every single night with the type of guys with the suspenders, just come from Wall Street, take off their jackets. Hey, order the $500 bottle of Barola. Oh, $70 for the veal palm? We don't care. We got a table at Carmine's, all right? That has nothing to do with the quality of the food, which is okay. Pretty good at Carmine's, but uh, you know, you, you would never want to be uh, booted out of there and be told you cannot go to a place like that. But Carmine's did, as I just noted, restore the idea of veal parmesan and other dishes like that, pork chops with vinegar peppers, the types of, of, uh, uh, of dishes that you used to find in old, old scale, old fashioned Italian restaurants, neighborhood restaurants, those have now come back to the fore. Patsy's restaurant, which is a theater district restaurant in New York, um, been there for 80 years, I think it has been, since the early 1950s. Um, they took meatballs off the menu at one point because that's low class. We're not selling meat, spaghetti and meatballs here. Um, and one week, uh, the, you know, the chef or the owner said, you know, why don't we just put them on as a special this week? Maybe some people would like, you know, don't make too many. Well, they sold 6,000 meatballs that week and they never <laughs> looked back. So they're on every single menu. So, um, the service and atmosphere is better in these places. Um, families should be, family restaurants should always be favored because those are the ones who are not buying and serving 350 people like at Mama Leone's in the, in the old days. Uh, and it is a contrast to what in Italy is called alta cucina or high-end cucina cuisine, where these days in top Italian restaurants in the United States, $25, $30 pastas are not unusual at all. I mean, in Italy, you still could get pasta, a nice plate of pasta for $10, $12, $14. I haven't seen any $30 pastas in Italy. But here, that's becoming ubiquitous. And it's because they can get away with it. Because their costs, especially post-COVID, have really gone gone up. So you're not play, paying for the pasta on the plate or the peppers or the tomatoes, obviously. Um, the $30 pasta is also something that most people order not as an appetizer course. Uh, so if some restaurants, if you want as an appetizer, it's not going to be $30. It's going to be $18 or something like that. Um, a lot of people, that's what they have. They go to an Italian restaurant, they order a plate of pasta and maybe a salad, and they're out the door sharing a tier to be soup. Um, so they're un under that kind of uh, onus, you know, you don't go to a steakhouse. Most guys don't go to a steakhouse and just order a steak, you know. They want the baked potato on the side and to, to start with, they want the shrimp cocktail or the, the, the leaning tower of ice there. And then they want the cheesecake afterwards. Um, so Italian restaurants operate under, under a different kind of margin. But I couldn't be happier to see that this kind of food, which my wife and I wrote, well, girl, well, where is it? Oh, look, I just picked it right off the shelf. This is... Our book, the Italian American Cookbook, which came out in 1995, I think, and it's still in print. And uh, what we say here is this, this is a this is a feast of food from a great American cooking tradition. But don't attempt to make anything in this book if you're going to go out and buy canned clams to make your linguine with clam sauce. 
don't just go buy some tomato sauce and stick it in a pan. Uh, if you're going to buy anything, you know, make your own yucky here. This is what kind of kind of, kind of veal you should buy. Um, but they are Italian American restaurant uh, recipes. So if you're going to look at our veal parmigiana recipe, it will tell you how to make the best one you will ever have. An excellent book, only one of uh, what a dozen or so that you've written. Yeah, yeah, by the by the way, John uh, uh, Coleman, would you because uh, uh, you you do the descriptions later on? Would you put the, uh, the either the link or the name of the book so people can easily find it? Because I know it's up on Amazon for sure. Uh, yeah, I think it's on Amazon. Right. Yeah, we'll do that. You know, John, just one last comment before we go, because I I love uh, I love Italian food, but I love talking about. Um, the history and the cultural changes, which you do, kind of putting things into perspective for us. And I had a comment along those lines. It, 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 COVID was a terrible thing. We, I think this country reacted to it badly. Um, but something interesting happened from COVID. Uh, the macaroni grill near us, which is a, a, a quote Italian restaurant chain, very popular, closed down, couldn't survive. And yet, the three little, I call the golden triangle, the three little Italian restaurants, neighborhood restaurants, all mom and pop restaurants, even if it's not mom and pop, you know, Uncle Tony is behind the counter. He's no, there's no mom back there. But um, those three restaurants survived, not easily, I don't think, but they survived and they're now blossoming. All three restaurants near me, um, Sorrento's, Mama Sorrento's in her 70s. Her husband died 10 years ago. Her sister's in the kitchen with a brother-in-law and a, a Spanish guy. I don't know where. But they make the best spaghetti sauce. They make it themselves. Um, those are the restaurants that we love. Well, of course, Macaroni Grill, uh, any of those chains, you think, well, they've got a lot of resources and financial uh, backing. Uh, they, can, they can last out. But they make probably razor thin profits on huge volume. They have to be open lunch and dinner and throughout the day. They have to turn those tables three or four times a day in order mm -hmm. to make a small profit. And it all adds up. But during COVID, um, if you ain't got nobody going through the door, meanwhile, mom and pop can just, you know, we don't need to turn the tables four times a night. We never did and we never will. Well, I love uh, the state of Italian food in the United States today. So, thank God. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.